Honeybees are central place foragers. That means they forage from a central place, their nest. They go out, they gather resources, and they return those resources back to the nest. Their challenge is to go out, find resources, and navigate back to the nest, and then to be able to communicate those locations to their social partners, their nest mates, so that they may also be able to go out and exploit those resources. To do this, they have a toolkit, and I call it the navigation toolkit. They have certain things that they're able to do that allow them to be able to navigate and then communicate accurately uh, the locations of the resources that they discover. First of all, they have an internal clock. And I'm gonna talk about each of these individually, but they have an internal clock. They have a clock that's going off in their bodies. It's, it's a biochemical clock that, that keeps time for them. Uh, they have a celestial compass where they actually internally have a, a compass where they can um, uh, orient direction. They have a solar clock. They can keep time relative to the sun and they learn that. They have an odometer. They have a mechanism where they can actually measure distances to resources. They're able to do vector analysis. So they can, they, they can determine what direction they're going in relative to the sun so they have, or relative to, um, to landmarks. They have an integrator, a vector integrator. They can integrate different vectors and then get one solution with respect to a uh, straight line direction. And they have an incredible ability to uh, remember landmarks. The celestial compass of a bee uh, has to do with their ability to um, uh, see polarized light and to be able to detect the polarization of the light in the sky in general. The celestial dome that sits over the top of us uh, is, is, is loaded with polarized light. As light comes in from the sun, it comes in in, in, in straight uh, trajectories or vectors until it strikes the atmosphere. The atmosphere then deflects, reflects the light. Well, the light in, without being reflected is vibrating in random directions. Uh, you know, light is a wave function and it vibrates. But once it, it's deflected by the atmosphere, stuff in the atmosphere, it becomes polarized. Then it just, it just vibrates in one plane. And the, the polarization varies with respect to the, the observer. So depending upon where the sun is relative to where you're observing, you'll see varying degrees of polarized light. For instance, if you have polarized sunglasses and you, and you look across the celestial dome over you at the sky, you'll notice that it'll get darker when you look certain directions and it gets lighter when you look other directions. What you're detecting is your, your, your polarized lights are screening out, sunglasses are screening out the polarized light. And so you can see it gets dark when, it's, when there's a lot of it and it's screening it out and it's lighter when it's not. So bees have the ability to look at the, the dome, the celestial dome over us, the sky, and detect the degree of polarization and get information from that polarization pattern that they're able to detect. They can get information of the location of the sun. Why should they do this when they can see the sun anyway? Uh, well, one reason is if the sun's covered um, by clouds or whatever, or just hidden below the, the horizon maybe, uh, they still can pick up polarized light in the sky and know the location of the sun by looking at polarized pattern. They do this uh, with some special receptors that they have on their eyes. So fundamentally, each eye of a bee has about 5,500 omatidia. That's worker bees. It's different with queens and with drones. Of these 550 omatidia, there's about 150 of them um, that, that 150 of them that are located at the top of the eye. And they're in, in a patch up at the very top of the eye. And these are, are sensitive to polarized light. And so they use these, these special omatidia on the top of their eyes to, to read this polarization pattern on the celestial dome uh, overhead. Also, they're very sensitive to ultraviolet. 
Ultraviolet is the, the best wavelength to actually show the polarization to them. And ultraviolet will penetrate the cloud cover so that they can continue to, to have um, uh, a view, a polarized view of the, of the celestial dome. The 150 or so omatidia that sit at the top of the eye that allow the bees to see polarized light have some special features associated with them. First of all, each omatidium uh, has nine photoreceptor cells that surround the, the omatidium as shown here. So there's nine of these cells that surround it. Inside of these, they have um, a basic structure with microvilli that are, a, that are a part of these visual cells, these photoreceptors surrounding the, the, um, the, the omatidium. And these microvilli are packed full of, of different pigments. Um, and also inside of them is rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is the chemical that, that, um, that results in firing an electrical signal, uh, the same as what we have in our eyes. Um, the photopigments that are packed into these are ultraviolet, green, and blue. Those are the three um, uh, types of receptors that honeybees have that allow them to have color vision that extends into the ultraviolet range, where ours does not extend into the ultraviolet range. These microvilli from, on these cells are all oriented towards the center. And the cells, the 150 cells at the top of the eye of the worker, are packed preferentially with ultraviolet uh, receptors. So they can see, detect ultraviolet uh, at a, at a, with a bias relative to the other color receptors. And again, this aids in, uh, in detecting polarized light. But the orientation of these microvilli is such that light that enters the eye through, the, through the, the lens and the cone as it gets funneled down and goes by these, these uh, microvilli. Um, the, they're tuned to different orientations of the, of the polarized light. So on the basis of the degree of polarization that travels down through these omatidia, they can get information about the amount of polarization of that particular um, bit of light that traveled down through them and they can get the information about the polarization of the, of the sky. Bees also have an internal clock, as do we. We have an internal clock. We have a clock that, that makes us sleepy at night. We, we're getting ready to go to bed. It wakes us up in the morning. It gives us, it makes us hungry at certain times of the day. It, it regulates a cycle. We, you know, we all know about our biological cycles and that they work on some sort of a diurnal basis. Um, bees have the same thing. Uh, if you look at flowers, flowers also have biological clocks that, 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 um, that affect them. It affects when the, it affects when the flowers open, uh, when nectar is produced, uh, when scent or odor is being released for, this is all for recruiting bees. Uh, the movement of the petals that it actually works with an internal clock and the availability of the pollen. When are the, what is the pollen going to be displayed and, and, and put out so that the bees can forage on it. Bees have this sun compass that they use for orientation. Uh, they actually have been shown to anticipate. So bef before a certain, a certain floral source will bloom in the morning, say, say the rewards are going to come at 10 o'clock from a certain patch of flowers, uh, the flowers are tuned. At 10 o'clock, they're going to turn on the nectar uh, and start recruiting. Um, the, the bees anticipate it. So an hour before that occurs or whatever, they'll start getting active and they'll kind of move around. They'll move down near the entrance of the nest or whatever. So they make movements in anticipation of an event that's going to happen when they will start foraging. They have just basic rhythmic uh, cycles they go through during the day and the night. Some people believe that bees sleep at night. The, the, the foragers are very much inactive during the, the nighttime. They can remember time of day, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And the internal clock is important with respect to dance communication. 
The clock is one that we call circadian. It's about a, a, a day in length. That's what circadian means, about one day. So it's, we have a, a roughly one day rhythm, and that's controlled by, so far, four known clock genes. And some of these are the same kind of clock genes that we have. That it's, it's basically, they interact with each other, certain time after certain period of time, one will go up or one will go down and they, they control each other and you get a pattern of activity that's then turned on according to what's part of the clock cycle you happen to be in with these with the, the, this rhythmic um, uh, expression of these clock genes. The internal clock and the celestial compass work together. They have to. Um, if think of it this way, that's a bee takes a flight and she um, collects a resource and she comes back to the nest and she checks her watch. She knows what time it is uh, and she knows where the sun was. And so then she goes back on her next trip and she says, OK, I, it, 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 I'm going to go. Um, 90 degrees to the right of the location of the sun. Well, when she goes back out, the sun has changed direction because, because it's changing direction over the course of the day. So now if she goes out, it's not going to be 90 degrees to the right of the sun anymore. It may be 45 degrees to the right of the sun where the source actually is. So she has to be able to have her internal clock to know how much time has gone by while she was in the nest. Uh, she has to be able to know uh, the 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 timing of the path of the sun. She has to learn the speed of its, of its trajectory a, 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 along the horizon uh, in order for her to get it accurately. And it's the same when she goes back and does her dance. Or if she gets up the next morning and goes and forages again, the sun may be way over here. She has to know that, okay, well, I forage last at three in the afternoon. It's, um, it's eight o'clock in the morning now. So let's see, the sun's moved over here. So they, they have to learn the the path of the sun across the horizon, and they have to integrate that into their, their um, uh, internal clock and their compass. So each time they take a flight, they recalibrate. Uh, every flight, they relearn the, not only the location of the sun, but also the rate of change of the, of the sun, the location of the sun. So they have to recalibrate. Without the recalibration, the direction information would be off. Bees have an odometer. Uh, they have, the odometer uh, gives them the distance information. So the, the celestial clock and the compass can, will give them the directional information, but they also have to know how far they're going and how far they've been. So each eye has about 5,500 omatidia. And these omatidia are very, very well tuned for, for visual motion, motion going across the eye. So any kind of object that crosses their path, they're very good at detecting the rate of the flow of it because the different omatidia will be firing their neurons into the brain. And so you can get, they, get a, they can determine the, the amount of, of, of change in, those, in their visual field and can calculate, they call that optic flow. So as a bee flies along uh, the landscape, f flying from the nest to the, to the source of food, uh, the, the landscape objects on the horizon, uh, or uh, their visual horizon, are going by, by their, their heads. And so there's some measure of flow. You can get it too, you can see things moving, but they have a good way of measuring how much of this optic flow so it's just simply how much flow goes by the eyes gives them an indication of how far they've flown. Experiments to show this have been uh, training bees to fly down a, a box chamber that has differing degrees of patterns along the side of the walls to see what the effect is on their dance. So they can use the bee to report back what it thinks the distance is that it's foraging. So when they put a bee flying down a, one of these horizontal um, 
chambers, flight chambers. Uh, she can fly down. She can get a, a feeder that's close by, and she'll do a round dance, saying, "Oh, it's very close." Uh, as she fly, if you put the feeder at the other end, she's going to do uh, a waggle dance because her perception as she's flown down this is that she has flown a great distance because there's been a lot of optical flow by these black bars that are put inside of this box. So she thinks there's been a lot of optic flow. She says, oh, I flew 200 meters because that's the amount of optic flow that I experienced. So she does a waggle dance with a, a, a direction indication of, of uh, 100 meters. If you test her in another box where you don't have these vertical stripes, but instead you have horizontal where they don't get this, she doesn't get the optic flow that's being that's being generated by the, the the broken pattern of these of these bars, which would be similar to the broken pattern of the landscape as you fly. Then, if she flies even a long distance, even six meters down this this um, uh, flight chamber, she still does a round dance because she wasn't she didn't measure any optic flow uh, flying down it. If you if you increase the the, the pattern of the of the um, inside of the box to where there's there's more vertical stripes or more complexity to it, you can get them to fly to, to indicate in their dance that they flew different distances. So this is all about measuring optic flow. It's not oh I expended this much energy or it took me that much time or it's been time and energy and I integrated. It's simply the amount of optic flow that's being measured by the bee as she flies from the nest to her resource and back. So bees are able to measure vectors. We know that because we've, we can see it in the, in the dance language. We, we know that they can do vectors of the, of the resource they're foraging on uh, relative to the location of the sun, and that they can translate that vector from the, uh, a horizontal plane into a vertical plane and do their dance. So they can measure vectors. So they do vector analysis and, and they, and with respect to path integration. So the path integrator combines the odometer and their ability to use compass information. So the, the directional and, and the uh, distance components can be integrated. For instance, um, if they fly from, from the, the hive directly to a source, well, there's a vector that they flew on and they can you know, easily measure the, the uh, distance by their, by their um, optic flow and the angle they flew in by the, uh, by the angle of the sun relative to the resource. But often they don't go in a straight line. Often they go, take a circuitous route uh, when they're discovering a resource. They're out scouting around or whatever. And they may cast about in this pattern that's shown on, on the right. Um, they'll go one direction, not find something. They'll turn, they'll go another direction, and then go turn again. And so they cast about uh, as they're looking for a resource. But now, how do they know where they've been? Well, they're able to, to integrate their paths that they've been on. So they, they say, well, I, you know, I, I went this, here they went this way for a while, and they went that way for a while. But then they get a, they get a ledger basically, um, flying 90 degrees to the right of the sun for this amount of optic flow and then changing directions to a different angle to the sun for a different optic flow. And they can integrate all that together. And when they get to a food source and they find something, they don't go back and they, they don't unravel the optic flow chart that they made or they, they made a, maybe a listing of the vectors and optic flow like we might do, they integrate it all and they fly directly back to the hive. They take a path they never went on. They're able to integrate all these changes and turns and everything and they go back the way that directly to the nest and they do a dance that gives the straight line distance and the straight line um, direction. This was nicely demonstrated by some of Carl von Frisch's students. Uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, they put a observation hive on one side of a mountain and the feeder on the other side of the mountain. The, they then trained bees by putting out 
sugar solution in different, different places out and around the mountain. They trained the bees to fly around the mountain and to the food source. Then when they went and looked at the dances that were being performed in the nest, the dances showed the correct direction and the correct distance as if they had flown in a straight line through the middle of the mountain. Their path integrators had integrated the path. Bees can learn landmarks. They can learn lots of different landmarks and they use the landmarks. It's been shown that landmarks can become very important. And they can use the landmarks and integrate landmarks into their vectors to do their path analysis and their vector analysis uh, to determine where, where different things are relative to the hive. There's a big question about whether or not there's a cognitive map. Is, is the map in a, in, a, in a honeybee's brain just simply a collection of these vectors and vector analysis? Or do they have, like we have, in, in a, an overview of the landscape to where they can pick, you could pick out novel places to go. Like, you know, we don't have to be uh, on the street two blocks over and three blocks up to, to know how to get there. Uh, because we have a visual map in our heads and even though we've never been there before, we can, get, we can go right to it. Uh, the question is, is do they have um, such a, map, a mapping ability or are they just using their vector integration along with landmarks uh, to, to get from one place to the other?